my name is Hayley and this is Susan and welcome to Cancer Research Demystified. Today we're going to tell you about one of the most used resources in many cancer labs and that's actually the cancer cell. Right, so we do actually grow real cells in the lab. It's a very basic model that we use to look at things like new diagnostics or therapeutics but on that very kind of basic early stage level in the lab. Um, and we do actually grow them. It's kind of like gardening, so yeah, researchers do spend hours every week just like tending to them, making sure they're comfortable, keeping them well nourished, well fed, and keeping them alive. All this, and then we try and kill them in the end. <laughs> yeah. There are lots of different types of cancer cell that we grow in the lab. Each of the different types is called a cell line, and the process of culturing them is called cell culture. Each cell line has been derived from a different human tumour, and they've been immortalised so they can grow indefinitely on plastic. Some of the cell lines we use were actually isolated from cancer patients as far back as the 1950s. And you may have heard of a woman called Henrietta Lacks, so her cancer cells were taken without her knowledge as far back as 1951. Over the years, scientists have grown 20 tonnes of her cells, and this has understandably led to much ethical debate within the scientific community. So these days, things are very different. So if we were to try and grow cells from your cancer, you'd have to be consented. There's very strict ethics about what we can and cannot take. And there'd be a lot of discussions that you'd have to go through before you're recruited to any study that would do that. So this flask here has a layer of cells on the base of it, covered in media that feeds the cells and keeps them nice and happy. We can look at them down the microscope. In our lab, we culture a few dozen different types of cell lines representing different cancers, such as prostate cancer. Each cell line represents a different stage or aggressiveness of disease, and we have information about the genetic backgrounds of each line that we can take into account when looking at our data. When we're not using the cells for experiments, we keep them dormant, frozen at minus 80 degrees. When we do want to use them, we grow them in humid incubators at body temperature and with appropriate oxygen and carbon dioxide levels to represent the human body. So we do all our cell culture in a pod, a bit like this one. And what happens is inside here it's completely sterile. There's a magical air curtain along here, so when we put our hands in, the air seals around it. Everything is inside is sterile. We have special sprays and things that we use to clean the things that we're going to put inside. The reason why it has to be sterile is because these cells can get infections like we can. If we get bacteria, fungus, they'll grow like crazy in here. Since the cells grow indefinitely, they quickly outgrow their flasks. So we have to kind of spend a lot of time looking after them. So it's about two or three times a week we have to do what we call passaging the cells. If you imagine it's a bit like gardening, so if there are a load of plants in a bed here, they just keep growing and growing and spreading out, and we need to thin that out a bit. So we use an enzyme to remove the cells from the bottom of the flask. We then mix it with some of the fresh media, and we divide it up. Some for a new experiment, some into a new flask for prolonged culture, the rest of them get thrown away. The cells that are in the new flask then spend the next few days growing, spreading out, getting happy, until they run out of space, and we have to repeat the procedure all again. Cell lines allow us to learn more about how cancer develops and progresses, as well as to test new diagnostics and therapies. Because they're such a cheap resource and they just keep growing indefinitely, we can test lots and lots of different therapies at the same time. So there are some really good benefits to cell lines, but with that come some caveats as well. So some of those problems with cell lines are that cell lines are quite a crude way of investigating cancer. Each cell line is essentially just lots of one single type of cell. In tumours in humans, you get a really complicated mix. You get cancer cells, and they're all interspersed with normal cells, with blood, with vasculature, complex biological signals going here and there between all the different cells. Because of this, a lot of findings that we get from these cancer cells, they just don't validate when we look at them in humans. So despite all these issues, there's obviously a reason why we use them, otherwise there wouldn't be researchers all over the world tending to their cells right this very minute. Um, and that's because they're cheap, they're quick, they're easy, and they do give us some good answers about cancer. They also allow us to test things. You can never bring a drug straight into patients. I mean, you'd have to look at it in a basic model like cells first and then kind of take it through all the stages before it's actually safe to bring to a human. 
So there's a lot of stages in between these cells and the humans and we can do some really clever things now. Make organs using different cells, replicate what we see in the body, even grow bits of tissue from the body outside the body for longer than we would normally think we could. So if you have any questions about that, if you're interested in that, let us know in the comments and we can maybe go into that. Um, so thank you for watching and we'll see you again soon. See you next time.